Hello everyone and welcome to today's healthcare provider webinar, Managing Side Effects with CBD. We're really pleased to have you with us today. My name is Stephanie Washburn and I'm the Manager of Healthcare Provider Outreach at Living Beyond Breast Cancer. I'm pleased to serve as your moderator for today's program in support of your ongoing care of people affected by breast cancer. We selected today's webinar topic because of its importance to breast cancer patients and healthcare providers alike. Our objectives for the program today are to increase participants' knowledge of CBD products and how they work, how CBD can be used to treat side effects of breast cancer, including current research and anticipated future trends, and the potential interactions of CBD with breast cancer treatment and how to manage this. We'll also discuss how to effectively respond to patients' questions and guide them on CBD use. I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Alex Capano and Dr. Brooke Worcester, for sharing their time and expertise. We're very happy they could both join us today. And a special thank you as well to our partner, Amanda Health, for their support of today's program. Before moving on to our presentation, I'd like to highlight several LBBC resources. We'll be providing links to these resources by email after the webinar so you can share the information with your patients and colleagues. You'll see on the screen information about three resource hubs, which were developed last year to meet your and your patients' need for, needs for information. The first two hubs are for people with newly diagnosed early stage and newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer, and they offer dedicated resources about diagnosis and treatment, coping and relationships, and more. The third is a healthcare provider information hub with resources for you and to pass along to your patients. We also wanted to draw your attention to additional resources relevant to today's topic. Dr. Alex Capano, whom you will learn more about shortly, was interviewed by LBDC last year about CBD for side effects. This discussion is intended for a lay audience and the recording may be very helpful for your patients. In addition, on a related topic, also of great interest to patients and healthcare providers, Dr. Brooke Worcester spoke at our 2020 conference on metastatic breast cancer about managing symptoms and side effects with medical marijuana. This, wording, this recording is also available on our website. Finally, we wanted to highlight a blog written by a member of the LBBC community, Andrea Mathias Schmucky, about her experiences using CBD to manage side effects. Again, we'll share links to these resources by email after the webinar. Now let's move on to today's presentation. In today's format, format Dr. Capano and Worcester will present, and then we will take your questions. We're recording the session and we'll post it in the coming days on lbbc.org, so you'll be able to watch again. The slides will also be posted. We'll notify you via email when these items are available. One last housekeeping note, we'll be emailing you a link to our program evaluation later today. Your feedback is really important to us in planning future healthcare provider webinars, and we appreciate you taking the time to complete the evaluation. While we're unable to offer CEs for this program, certificates of participation will be available upon request through the evaluation process. Certificates will be emailed by February 17th. It's now my pleasure to introduce our expert speakers. Dr. Alex Capano is the Chief Science Officer at Ecofiber Limited, a global biotech company focused on hemp-derived supplements, food, textiles, and medical devices. Recently, Dr. Capano published a study on the possibility of using cannabinoids to reduce opioid use in chronic pain patients. Her, chronic, her current projects include researching CBD's role in treating chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain and agitation in dementia patients, as well as identifying industrial applications of hemp-derived cannabinoids. Dr. Capano is also a senior fellow at Thomas Jefferson University and a board-certified family nurse practitioner. We also welcome Dr. Brooke Lister, an associate professor of medicine in the Thomas Jefferson University and Sydney Kimmel Medical College, who practices supportive medicine and cancer pain management as the medical director of the new Center for Supportive Medicine and Cancer Survivorship. She is active teaching faculty for medical students, residents, and fellows, and serves as director for the master's program in cannabis at the Institute of Emerging Health Professions at Sydney Kimmel Medical College. 
Dr. Worcester's research interests, for which she has earned grant support, involve the use, impact, and perceptions of cannabis in pain management and other serious illnesses. We're grateful to Drs. Capano and Worcester for sharing their knowledge about CBD for managing side effects. Dr. Capano, at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so for today, we're going to, oh, I'm having a little trouble with the slides, everyone. We're gonna start with really a 101 of what is CBD, what is hemp, um, and then go on to how it can be effective for some side effects of cancer treatment and what side effects it may not be most useful for and best help you all answer your patient's questions. Um, we've recently seen some research that many patients are asking their oncologists and cancer healthcare teams questions about uh, medical cannabis or CBD, and often um, they don't get answers. So hopefully we can try to bridge that gap a little bit today. Uh, just full disclosure, I do have ties to the industry. I am employed by Ecofiber Limited, which owns Ananda Health. I think it's important to start a little bit with the history of hemp and cannabis. Um, technically, hemp is cannabis, and I'll get into what that means in a minute. But there's a lot of stigma, a lot of cultural and political baggage. So I want to really dispel some of those myths. Um, this is something that has been around for really all of documented human history, and there has been uses documented for thousands of years really all across the world. Um, cannabis was in the U.S. pharmacopoeia until 1937 and was actually one of the most widely used medications and certainly the most widely used pain medication. In 1937, something called the Marijuana Tax Act was introduced and passed, um, which effectively removed this from Americans' medical cabinet. That was vigorously opposed at the time by the American Medical Association and actually in the Library of Congress, there's some um, very compelling evidence that this was largely in response to the opioid lobby and the development of morphine. Um, this was truly political, not because of um, any danger that patients were experiencing because of this medicinal cannabis, but we really was based on money and, and frankly, racism, to be honest. Marijuana was a term used by Mexican immigrants and, and really due to xenophobia, did people start using the word marijuana and start to demonize it through um, films, for example, such as Reefer Madness. That actually came out as propaganda to get this tax act to pass. People didn't necessarily make the connection that what they were demonizing and outlying was this medication they had been using mostly for pain. And um, I would say it's a pretty heated debate. It's getting a little bit better, but uh, often people are kind of on one side of the spectrum or the other. It's either you know the devil's jazz cabbage or it's the miracle cure for everything, for everyone, all the time. And um, certainly the truth lies somewhere in the middle, maybe a little bit more towards the positive end, but I think the best way to delegitimize new therapy or reemerge therapy is to treat it like a panacea. You know, it becomes snake oil. So we'll talk about what it can really do and what it can't do. And after the 1937 Tax Act was passed, um, no cannabinoids were legal under federal law in the U.S. That changed um, after the passing of the 2018 Farm Bill, actually the 2014 Farm Bill, 2018 Farm Bill helped as well. Um, that removed hemp-derived cannabinoids from the Controlled Substances Act, and it's no longer under the purview of the DEA. So this is not considered Schedule One, not considered anything that the DEA controls, as long as it's derived from hemp that is grown in the U.S. under this uh, Farm Bill program. So this is something, if it's hemp-derived, that is legal over-the-counter in really all 50 states. So what is hemp? Um, hemp and marijuana are really legal terms of cannabis. 
And many of you may know all of this, but I you know, want to make sure we have the foundation before we get deeper. So hemp is a cannabis plant that has 0.3% THC or less by weight when it's dry. What's called marijuana, which again is a very charged term, but what is uh, considered marijuana is a cannabis plant that has 0.3% THC or higher, um, and that is not considered federally legal. Typically, when you have a cannabis plant high in CBD, which is what we're going to focus on today, it's going to be low in THC. So that's where we get um, a lot of abundant CBD available in a hemp plant. Whereas in a marijuana plant, the THC is going to be much higher, and that makes the CBD lower. And what is the difference between these two molecules? Um, THC is a compound that is primarily responsible for eliciting intoxication or a high in marijuana. Um, it's highly regulated, federally illegal. Um, people often say it's, it's uh, not psychoactive. I would call it not intoxicating. Um, CBD, sorry. Um, CBD is not intoxicating, so it can't get you high. Both CBD and THC have therapeutic potential in reality, certainly. Um, CBD does offer a lot of therapeutic impact without the negative consequences that THC may have, um, such as intoxication. Um, really, if we're thinking about patients increasing fall risk, um, THC, particularly at higher doses, can also induce anxiety. It can actually induce psychosis. Um, CBD is an anxiolytic and an antipsychotic. So it does not have those side effects. And they work a little differently in particular receptors in the body. And those receptors are abundant in the frontal lobe and the free prefrontal cortex, which is important for maturation of the frontal lobe, really for the, the adolescent or pediatric patients. So not relevant so much today. But the takeaway here is CBD's safety profile is generally considered better than THCs, although you know THC on the spectrum of things is still considered pretty safe. Both have therapeutic potential, um, and there's some differentiation there. I think for the purposes of today, an important thing to acknowledge quickly is that THC is going to be much better at um, inducing appetite. Basically, when people get the munchies, that's THC. Um, CBD may help with some nausea, but isn't going to induce appetite um, nearly as much, if at all, as THC will. So that is a therapeutic area where CBD, we don't see as much success. So both CBD and THC are considered cannabinoids. Cannabinoids are compounds that interact with and affect our endocannabinoid system. They are abundant in cannabis plants. Um, CBD and THC are the most well-known, the most abundant, and the most well-researched. Um, but they're not the only two cannabinoids. There are dozens and really over 100 um, of cannabinoid compounds in the plant. So the endocannabinoid system is the system on which these cannabinoids exert their effects. Um, Dr. Raphael Meshulam is kind of considered the grandfather of cannabinoid science, and he says, I cannot list all of the physiological systems and conditions affected by cannabinoids because there are too many. Uh, point being here is, you know, I mentioned panacea snake oil earlier because there are so many therapeutic areas where cannabinoids can be effective. And that is because of the endocannabinoid system, which unfortunately is not widely taught in medical schools, nursing schools, pharmacy schools, et cetera. But it is a matrix um, of receptors that are present throughout the body, abundant in the brain and central nervous system, as well as the periphery. And it influences homeostasis activity. So everything from uh, pain and inflammation, immune response, um, per, you know, your perception of pain and pleasure, uh, reproduction and fertility, your sleep cycle, digestion, mood, anxiety, motor control, et cetera. So because there 
are multiple targets that these receptors influence um, every second of every day, that is why cannabinoids have such a widespread therapeutic potential. So if you're wondering if any of this is real, um, the endocannabinoid system, while it was really first identified in the 70s, um, certainly you don't have to take cannabinoids to get the system to work. And that's because we actually make our own endogenous cannabinoids. Uh, those are known as anandamide and 2-AG. And then we have these exogenous plant-derived cannabinoids like CBD and THC, but again, many others. And there's a lot of slides here today, so I can't uh, take too much of your time. Obviously, we don't have that much. So I am happy for all of you to dig deeper, but we will get out kind of quickly through some of the more complex physiological discussions of the endocannabinoid system. So there are many different uh, CBD products on the market. Again, these are hemp-derived, over-the-counter CBD products. It is not a regulated industry yet. We are still waiting for FDA regulation, and that's probably going to take some time. They're still in data collection mode. So I'll get to later how to identify what a quality product is, but once you've done that, there are three different types of products. There's full spectrum, broad spectrum, and isolate. And what does that mean? Well, I talked about the other cannabinoids previously. And there's a pretty well-established theory that these cannabinoids work together and exert an effect that is greater than the sum of its parts. So that is known as the entourage effect, which when I first heard about it, um, thought a little pseudoscience but it is, in fact, um, pretty well accepted by the research community. So the entourage effect means that when you use CBD alone, it works, but it only works so well, and you have to use a lot of it. When you use CBD along with the other cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids that are found in the plant, it works that much better, and you can actually take less of it. So you're getting a better response at a lower dose. And the most important player of the entourage effect is what's called THC. So full spectrum, again, if we go back to this, full spectrum product means it has that trace amount of THC that is present in a hemp plant, um, not enough to consider uh, being able to intoxicate someone, but enough to contribute to the entourage effect. Then there's something called broad spectrum. So broad spectrum is when you have all of those other compounds that contribute to this entourage effect, but you don't have any trace amounts or detectable amounts of THC in it. Now, that's a good option for somebody who may um, need to take a drug test and cannot have uh, any risk of THC coming up in a drug test because that can happen. Lastly, you have isolate CBD. That is what GW Pharma's Epidiolex, which is FDA approved. That is isolated cannabidiol or CBD. Um, certainly has therapeutic potential because it would not have been approved by the FDA, but it, um, you will need more of it to get that therapeutic response, and overall we're seeing that the therapeutic response is not as great. So is this, you know, just clever marketing, or do we actually see this in the research? And, in fact, we do. So a relevant study um, led by Dr. Sarah Jane Ward at Temple demonstrated that when you use CBD, really just initially before these neurotoxic chemotherapy agents, it actually prevents the development of chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And she then published, along with her research team, a follow-up study that showed that when you added just a little bit of THC, it not only was more effective, but they could actually use a lower dose. Um, and you'll see here that when you use isolate, um, 
what we see in both animals and anecdotally, I have uh, some colleagues who are researchers in the epidiolex trials, to be honest, and told me it's the same in humans. Um, you have to use five to 10 times more CBD when it's used alone than when it's in combination with some THC. This is exciting to me because beta caryophylline is considered, um, it's not considered a cannabinoid traditionally, but it does interact with the endocannabinoid system. So there's some argument there, but it's really just a terpene. It's, it's not only found in cannabis plants, it's in other fruits and vegetables. But this also from Dr. Ward showed that beta caryophylline was almost as effective as CBD in reducing dental pain. So this is another compound going to contribute to that entourage effect um, and isn't THC. So that's why we know on kind of a, a scale, full spectrum, you'll get the most response at a lower dose broad spectrum, again, that's all those other compounds together, but without THC, you will get not as much of a response. And, you know, this is a generalization, uh, but you won't have to use as much. And then isolate at the end, you, there should be a response. You'll have to use more. And the response is unlikely to be uh, as great of an impact as full or broad spectrum. So what does this mean for cancer treatment? Um, you know, the title of this presentation is, is you know, intentional. Um, there's a lot of, I, I think, unethical, misleading, um, maybe just a really hopeful discussion out there about cannabis for, you know, cancer treatment, not as an adjunct for cancer treatment side effects. And you know what? Yeah, there's some research out there that's cool and promising, but it is in its infancy. Um, you know, I, it's really an embryo, if anything. So it's going to be a long time before this is incorporated into any sort of treatment plan for actually increasing um, apoptosis of cancer cells. But yeah, it's promising. I just always kind of double down to that that is not something I am uh, you know, confident to tell anyone. So, you know, uh, of course, you all in the cancer space have patients who really want to try everything to cure their illness and cure their disease. Um, and I do have people contact me very often asking me about cannabis for X, Y, or Z cancer. And I tell them it can help you get through it and feel better and improve your quality of life, hopefully. But you know, take your established treatments and listen listen to your oncology team. So the number one way I think people should use CBD is really for pain. And I come at this one from a harm reduction standpoint. So I know many patients um, who are on narcotics for cancer pain um, or for something like CIPN, even post cancer treatment. And certainly we all know opioids come with a considerable risk for not only dependency, accidental overdose, um, the side effects aren't great, and they don't tend to work that well for that long. So why CBD? Um, one, we see that cannabinoids, particularly CBD, are effective at treating pain. There are multiple systematic reviews that have come to that conclusion and say that that is supported by high quality evidence. One was actually published in JAMA. Um, number two, CBD is a safe adjunct to an opioid regimen. So I think, you know, if this isn't first line, it should at least be first line instead of increasing a, an opioid dose, um, instead of adding something like a benzo or a hypnotic if someone's having, you know, anxiety or sleep issues along with chronic pain that can certainly increase respiratory depression risk, cardiovascular risk. Um, there's pharmacokinetic studies that demonstrate CBD does not increase respiratory depression risk when in conjunction with opioids. Uh, those were done in humans. Um, lastly, there's some really great clinical trial evidence that CBD actually helps reduce and or eliminate the physiological side effects of opioid withdrawal. So, 
that's a major challenge to people trying to titrate down on these uh, narcotics. Um, it's really uncomfortable and it may limit their success. So, you know, when you're on these medications for a long period of time, whether or not there's a substance abuse issue there, and often there is not, um, they're, they're hard to get off of. But we see that cravings are actually reduced, um, nausea and other physiological side effects of opioid withdrawal are prevented or reduced when using CBD. So I think first line, try it. Um, opioids and narcotics, you know, are certainly there for a reason. I, I had a C-section about a year ago and um, I was someone who elected to take the opioid 48 hours after. And let me tell you, I was very happy <laughs> that I had access to them. But, um, you know, there's a time and place and I think we all understand the risks with chronic use. And then, you know, if somebody has to be on them, this is something that can be a safe adjunct or alternative to other treatments. I did Alex, study this. Um, yeah. Hey, can I jump in for one second there? Because I, I, I do, do think it's really important, a, a great point that you made there. Um, pain is not pain is not pain is not pain, right? So we sort of think about or talk about pain as this one single entity, but we know better. And there's lots of different types of pain, um, etiologies of pain and trajectories of pain. And so I think that's part of the problem when people look at using CBD, cannabis, he you know, hemp, whatever we're talking about here in pain is that sometimes it's really great and really helpful. And I agree with you. And sometimes, and we have good evidence, you know, not good, but in the world of cannabis, we have some evidence sort of ranking where it's less helpful. And so some of the misconceptions out there are, you know, that it's like an all or none phenomenon. And I think mm -hmm. things like this and what we're talking about here are sort of guiding people and giving some more nuanced approaches to where and how best to use this is what is needed more. Because otherwise it becomes this, you know, it's all great or it's all awful, which is what is kind of, I think, plagued the, the use of, of any form of cannabis for you know too too long now, so I, I think it's a really important point you made about kind of the the types of pain and sort of where we're thinking about using it. Thanks, thank you. Um, you know, and this study that I, I published last year, it, that exactly what you just said came up. So these were chronic pain patients, but all different etiologies. Um, we saw different outcomes across the diagnoses. Um, we saw some success, but we didn't see miracles. Um, you know, there were a couple of participants who added CBD to their opioid regimen that they'd been on for years. And within eight weeks, they eliminated their opioids. But guess what? Like, that is the outlier. That is the exception. There's probably some other um, motivation or something else going on. You know, so I, I just want expectations to be realistic and reasonable because pain is real and, um, you know, we need to treat it. So in this study, it was really an open label design that was because of research restrictions at the time that it started that have since uh, mostly gone away. So basically, chronic pain patients had been on opioids, a stable regimen for at least a year. Many had been on a stable regimen for many years, uh, a few even a decade. Um, they were offered whether or not to add CBD to their regimen or not, either way was fine, follow them over eight weeks, measure their pain, their opioid use, uh, and their quality of life measured subjectively and then um, also through sleep, mood, and pain. So 97 participants completed the study. Um, I believe 95 of them elected to take the CBD, so there wasn't even a pseudo-control group here. Um, and of those 97 participants, over half of them reduced or eliminated their opioids within eight weeks. And when I say eliminated, I think that was two people, um, and they were probably on a very low dose uh, to begin with. 
Um, almost all of them who added CBD to their regimen reported quality of life improvements. And some of these, you know, for example, one participant, he didn't have a statistically significant or just a significant improvement in, um, you know, sleep or mood. And he didn't reduce his opioid use, but he did tell me that he could start dancing again. Um, and he loved to dance. And he hadn't danced for years because he was in too much pain, but he started dancing for 30 minutes every day. And you know what? That was exercise and that was happiness and that was socialization because this was pre-2020 and, you know, he could go out and find places to dance and interact with people and he hadn't been doing that for years. Um and, you know, maybe that's going to help him get healthier overall. So, you know, I still took that as a win, even though there was no reduction in opioids. That was working for him. Um, but we did see over half of, of participants reduce their opioids. Um, almost all of them reported some quality of life improvement. And we saw a statistically significant improvement in sleep and in pain, uh, interestingly enough, even though there were fewer opioids in many people's regimens. Um, we did not see a statistically significant improvement in mood. It trended that way, but uh, perhaps if we had gone longer. Um, this, you know, this is not a placebo-controlled blinded trial, so certainly risk for bias here. I did not collect any data um, to try to keep myself out of it, certainly because it is sponsored by an entity of my employer. Um, but it was important because this wasn't just a survey study emailed to people who are self-selecting participants and probably big fans of CBD or cannabis. Um, this was an, uh, you know, a consistent uniform over-the-counter product. We knew what they were taking. We knew exactly how much they were taking. We knew the delivery method. Um, and to be honest, most of the research out there uses really high doses of CBD, um, what I think is super therapeutic, and it's typically isolate. This was full spectrum, and almost all of the patients took 30 milligrams a day. You see research out there with 300, 600, 1,500 milligrams a day, and there's a lot of pushback that these smaller doses don't work. Um, I do see it in, in my... Uh, life and a lot of my colleagues' life often. So this was nice to get that demonstrated in, you know, a, a peer-reviewed journal that 30 milligrams did cause a result in this population. What's exciting though is now we're actually able to talk to the FDA who's asking for more data to give them more data with um, phase two clinical trials. This is a phase two clinical trial that is currently enrolling participants, and uh, we would love to enroll many more participants. So we are looking at chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain or peripheral neuropathy. I think someone else wrote that. But um, this was born from that animal research from Dr. Ward and Dr. Tuma's lab at Temple that I mentioned earlier. So you know, does this animal research translate to humans? And, you know, we hypothesize that it in fact does. And either way, there's really, um, there's no FDA approved medications for this. It's pretty common with a lot of these neurotoxic chemo agents, as you all know, and uh, it can be treatment limiting because it's so debilitating. And, you know, even when people are cured or go into remission, uh, they can end up with this chronic condition and poor quality of life. So we want to find answers. And there's some evidence that cannabinoids and especially CBD uh, may be an answer. So this is, again, a phase two clinical trial. Uh, we received FDA authorization in July of 2019 for this and began enrollment in 2020. Uh, this is being done uh, through the Lankanaw Institute of Medical Research and Mainline Health just outside of Philly. And one of the co-PIs on it, Dr. Marisa Weiss, is the CMO and founder of breastcancer.org. Um, and please, if you have patients, uh, we've actually expanded the uh, patient population who is eligible to breast, uh, breast 
um, endometrial, uterine, and colon cancer. And I actually just got some interim data last night, so I did not get to put it on a slide, but I'm very excited to share it with you. Um, so far, this is a relatively high dose for a full spectrum CBD product. Um, it is about 135 milligrams a day, and that's more than we see um, the general population taking. And the question was really about liver toxicity tolerability. We have seen zero adverse effects. There have been no safety issues with uh, monitoring LFTs, no tolerability issues from anyone in the study, so you know, placebo or intervention group. Um, so far, half of the participants have improved, half had not. Um, certainly, we're all blinded to what category they fall into, um, but the co-PIs are speaking to the Data Safety Monitoring Board because the question is, is it even ethical to continue giving placebo if the intervention is working so well? So we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, but everyone who has been a participant in the study and completed it um, does want to continue on the product or get the product if they were in placebo. Um, but I think that safety and tolerability is really important because that's certainly what we worry about in this population. And so far, this is really, really exciting. So pain would be number one. Um, I'm going to sit, talk about sleep. We don't have too much time, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. But um, we do see that CBD um, does seem to help induce sleep and also increase REM sleep. Uh, versus placebo, um, we're seeing more and more case studies, case series, and even clinical trials come out about this. Certainly when you're sleeping better, um, I think your quality of life is better. Uh, the important message here is that it's going to have a greater sedative effect at a higher dose. So if someone is using CBD, not really getting anything out of it for sleep, um, up that dose. And also mood, um, I think cancer diagnosis and treatment certainly comes with some disruptions to mood. So we do see that CBD is, it has anxiolytic effects um, mostly through the 5-H2NA serotonin receptors. Um, other mechanisms of action there, um, one of the questions I'm going to anticipate is whether or not this is safe to use with SSRIs and uh, if there's a risk of serotonin syndrome. There are no documented case studies. Uh, I have never seen it. I think it's very low risk, but certainly, as always, you know, talk to your patients if they want to try it, monitor them, let them know the signs. Um, anything that you've ever seen with that, Brooke? No, nothing, okay. nothing remarkable. Yeah. A major concern for CBD use with chemotherapy is drug interaction. If you're using CBD as an adjunct, um, is it going to reduce the efficacy of the chemotherapy, particularly through um, competition for metabolism at CYP450 enzymes and really at CYP2D6? Um, and the reality is we don't no, <laughs> there's not enough data out there. Um, I think I, I join the majority of clinicians who are in one or either of these spaces and, and some of us who are in both of these spaces um, of being cancer and, and can cannabis. <laughs> it, at low doses where people are getting a therapeutic response are happy with the effects of CBD, um, those doses are so low that they are not causing any sort of interaction with chemotherapy. But overall, we do need more data. Um, there was a study published just last year uh, evaluating this, not in breast cancer patients, but with ovarian and endometrial, endometrial um, cancer. And this study did conclude that it did not decrease the 
metabolism or efficacy of um, the chemotherapy, but actually improved apoptosis in those cells. Yeah. Alex, one other, um, I think this is one of the biggest things that, you know, I agree. I, I want more information about this, right? What are the pharmacokinetics and what are the drug-drug interactions? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think most people feel confident in saying in kind of safe, commonly used tolerable doses, it doesn't seem like there is any meaningful interaction. Um, there was another good um, article that came out of researchers that are working out of um, Penn State, Hershey, that are um, from pharmacists that, that were, was published in a cannabis journal that, that reviewed a ton of drug-drug interactions that they did in kind of preclinical laboratory settings with the P450 interactions, and none of the chemotherapy drugs that they kind of looked at it against showed any meaningful difference in metabolism there. And that, that's another good um, reference. I'm happy to kind of share that afterwards with everybody, but I think it does support what you were saying. It certainly isn't enough, but it, it sort of supports this idea that it, it's probably safe. Right. And, you know, there's also uh, an opportunity if you or your patient doesn't feel safe with the, it's probably safe. Um, this is certainly still applicable to use if someone chooses to after uh, chemotherapy when that when they no longer have that risk. Um, another question I get a lot, and particularly from folks in the oncology world, is, but don't we already have cannabinoids? Um, you know, we have FDA-approved medications that are cannabinoids. And the difference is, if you're talking about, you know, nabalone, for example, it's synthetic. And one, it's not going to have that benefit of the entourage effect I mentioned, but there is uh, actually multiple systematic reviews, and they're listed here if you want to go through them later, um, that demonstrate that these synthetic cannabinoids, basically they have a greater binder binding affinity for CB1 receptors, maybe even CB2 receptors, than does uh, phyto-derived THC. Typically, they have no CBD in them, uh, and that is important because CBD tends to protect against some of those anxiety or psychotic uh, side effects that THC can cause. And also that synthetic THC actually causes those um, psychiatric adverse effects much more commonly because of its different binding affinity than does phytocannabinoids. So we do see a much better safety profile, but also um, better therapeutic response with these plant-derived cannabinoids versus the synthetic cannabinoids that have been um, around for some time. So we're short on time. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the other important points here. Dosing and delivery. So with anything, this matters. Um, we see that this really has a bell-shaped dose response curve. So more is not always better. I always tell people start low, go slow. I think most people say that. Um, titrate up slowly with a full spectrum CBD product. I tell people to take between 10 and 15 milligrams total uh, to begin and to titrate up every two or three days. If they continue to titrate up and feel worse, then you know they've come down the descending slope here. Or if they continue to titrate up and their response isn't changing at all, they're kind of at that peak, go back. The lowest effective dose. We want the lowest effective dose of everything, right? If you use an oil under the tongue, um, it will have greater bioavailability due to bypassing first pass metabolism than does an oral, for example, a soft gel. Um, topical application is, is certainly a good option here. I would say it's often used as kind of an adjunct or companion to a systemic product but some people may feel more comfortable with the topical. Um, these are not transdermal delivery mechanisms right now, so at least not over the counter. So um, this is something that is, you know, useful for localized pain, local response, and, and not systemic uptake. I think we covered this. An important thing also with um, CBD in general with drug interactions is it does seem to be that the 
kind of magic number that we see in the research is 20 milligrams per kilogram body weight. That dose, which is, you know, very high. If we have uh, the majority of population taking CBD using, you know, 20, 30 milligrams a day, 20 milligrams per kilogram is going to be, you know, 50, 75 times higher than that. Um, that, that number, though, 20 milligrams per kilogram, 20 minutes per keg is is where we start to see meaningful interactions, as Dr. Worcester said, more um, commonly. Um, it's also where we see a greater risk for liver tox issues, particularly with those with pre-existing liver condition. It's also where we see almost a tenfold increase in side effects. So we want to keep. Um, lower on this. I think another important there's like yeah. zero <laughs> clinical kind of meaningful reason why anyone should be taking doses that high. I think I agree of, with you completely. <laughs> yeah. The the lack of guidance and regulation and, and sort of oversight in this in general is the reason that happens unfortunately. Um, but but there's no meaningful clinical benefit at all to taking it that high. Yeah, it's like you 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 see these kind of headlines that say CBD um, can cause liver toxicity and, and liver injury, and certainly that's concerning. But then when you look into it, yes, it can at these. Yeah, I mean it's like acetaminophen. If you take the whole bottle, you can also right. have liver injury, right? But at meaningful right. clinical doses, right. we're not worried. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to wrap up, but I will say that um, know that if someone is taking a full spectrum product, they can fail a drug test. So if someone needs that for their employer um, or you know even a pain management clinic, uh, please let them know that that is a risk. It's not that likely, but it does happen. Sometimes uh, a letter from me um, in collaboration with their physician is helpful but not always. So if that's the case, um, just inform them that failing a drug test is possible even with these hemp-derived products. And quickly, the most important point here is this is an unregulated market. So, you know, people call it the Wild West. I, I think that's an accurate description. Um, in 2016, the FDA said 91% of CBD products don't match their packaging. Um, Dr. Bob Miller and his colleagues published in JAMA in 2017 that 70% of products don't match their label. Um, there's been more follow-up on this from the FDA. It does seem to be trending better, but still um, just over half of products on the market don't match their label. So they're looking for um, potency. So if a product says, you know, it's 20 milligrams per serving, we're finding out that it's really 10 milligrams per serving. Uh, sometimes it's zero per serving. Um, secondly, we want to make sure, yes, you are getting what you're paying for and the potency is accurate, but also that you're not putting anything dangerous in your body. Um, cannabis and, and hemp are, you know, types of plants that are going to pull heavy metals from the soil. We want to make sure that's not in the product. So the manufacturer needs to test for pesticides, microbes, um, any molds, chemicals, certainly residual solvents, and show that readily for every single product. The products should have lot numbers on them, and they should uh, reflect that lot number with a certificate of analysis that is done by a legitimate third-party lab that's ISO certified. Um, that really should be industry standard. Unfortunately, it is the exception. Um, I will say that Ananda, who is you know part of the umbrella of Ecofiber where I work, we do have QR codes on every single product. That means that someone can just scan them with their phone um, and get that certificate of analysis to make sure that the potency and purity is in fact there. Um, as you can imagine, going through the process of getting FDA authorization for these phase two clinical trials, we actually have multiple um, going on right now. 
and enrolling patients, um, the FDA really looked at the product and whether or not it was safe. And these are vulnerable populations in the cancer space and the dementia space. So um, it, they said, okay, you can use them. That was great, but all products should make this readily available. Um, you shouldn't have to track it down. It should be reliable, lot specific and comprehensive. I think that's the biggest takeaway is, you know, overwhelmingly we have um, promising tolerability and safety profile of CBD as long as the product itself is safe, high quality, and actually has in it um, the good stuff and, and none of the bad stuff. So it's really about finding the right thing. We don't have time for all of this. Um, and you know, I'm supposed to tell you if you want to know where that brand is, you can go to nandahemp.com. Um, there's also one if someone would like to go to a pharmacy and speak to somebody um, about this from their healthcare team or you know, at a pharmacy, they can get that brand and end a professional. So thank you very much. And Dr. Worcester, if you want to add anything, but I also, we only have about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, that, I, I happily turn it over for questions. Seems like time-wise that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. We'll now be okay. done with question and answer session. If you'd like yeah. to place the question queue, please press star one on your telephone keypad, or you can type your question into the ask a question feature on the left side of your screen. One moment while we poll for questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Scapano and Worcester for this extremely informative presentation. I learned a lot. I am certain that our audience has as well. Um, so as we just stated, we'll move on to some Q&A with our audience. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in. I actually think a lot of them you've touched on through the presentation. Um, there is one, I know you talked about safety with um, certain medications. There was one specifically about CBD uh, and its safety for women who are on tamoxifen. I'm just curious if you could comment on that. I think I, I would say, and, and please jump in here. Brooke, if you have different thoughts, but there's um, a lack of high quality inclusive data because people just haven't done the studies yet. What we see in practice and what we know about these um, products and, and CBD in general is that the doses people are taking, there's really no meaningful interaction or issue with um, Certainly any drug. The biggest issue is, is not something like tamoxifen. It, it seems to be warfarin is most sensitive, but like what doesn't it interact with warfarin? But even then, there's only one case study uh, where they saw any difference at 10 milligrams per kilogram of weight. Again, that's a much higher dose than anyone's going to be on. Yeah, I mean, I think what we know is from animal models and preclinical pre uh, data that has come out that there is definitely some kind of an interaction between the endocannabinoid system and hormonally positive breast cancer treatments specifically like tamoxifen and others. Now, that is true for lots of things. And does it bear any meaningful outcomes clinically? We don't know. Um, I think that, you know, some of the way that I counsel my patients um, is to say, you have to be comfortable with what you're putting in your body, knowing that I can tell you I believe that it is safe, but I cannot be certain. And I feel that way about a lot of things that I prescribe to you or we talk about, right? Um, but... You know, this is something that I want you to know ahead of time. And, and really where I worry are either people trying to follow some online guidance for super high dose use of CBD or THC or, you know, some of the RSO preparations um, that, that don't get good medical guidance. Um, those are the people that I, that I worry about. But otherwise, like Alex said, it, it, it seems to be something that probably doesn't have any clinically meaningful kind of interactions. Okay, great. Thank you both for your thoughts about that. 
Um, we have a question uh, about cost barriers. The person who submitted this question said that they work in a low income area. I'm wondering if you have any um, recommendations about helping people access CBD. It's a great question. And, you know, I actually had in my notes to discuss that because uh, I, I started about stigma. Um, and unfortunately, that stigma, I think, translates now into to lack of access for lower income patients. Um, at least when it comes to CBD products, at pharmacies, many pharmacies allow um, use of, of flex spending accounts, so that may be an option to help. Um, we at Ananda and, and Ecofiber are trying to figure out how to uh, bridge this gap. Um, we've actually, you know, donated products to different nonprofits um, to try to, you know, expand access. But I, I don't have a, a great answer for that. Um, and I, I will say that the cost of these products is coming down and I think will continue to go down over time. Yeah, there is no good answer. It is a burden yeah. in light of all of the other financial hardships that cancer treatments put on our patients. Um, I think the more that we do research and advocate for insurance coverage of this, you know, on the horizon, that might be an option, but I see it all the time in my patients that they can't afford to access it, whether we're talking about something that is a CBD product or something from a dispensary that is, you know, a cannabis product with THC mm -hmm. in it. it it's a burden. And, it's, and, and that's a, it's, it's, a, it's an issue with dispensaries because uh, often the medical marijuana products in dispensaries are a lot more expensive than, you know, what is called, uh, you know, what some people would call like the street market or the illicit market or the legacy market, um, which means they may not go to the dispensary and may not be getting something that is safe, um, something where they, if they're in the state of Pennsylvania, for example, can actually really talk to a clinician about which product is going to be best. So it, it's an overall industry issue, healthcare issue. Yeah, absolutely a very complicated one. And thank you for your, your comments about that. I think we have time for just one more question, and this is something I know that you did touch on um, a bit earlier in the presentation, but there's a question, again, kind of about the delivery method. What's the best way to take it orally as an oil, as a pill or a tablet? Do you add the foil to, to food, et cetera? So wondering if you might be able to just um, add a little bit more insight into that question. So um, sublingual, Delivery, so an oil under the tongue is going to um, bypass or bypass uh, the majority, at least, of um, first pass metabolism. So you will get kind of more bang for your buck, a more rapid onset, um, but the effects may not last as long. I do think that that's better. Let's you know save your liver, liver a, a little less processing. Um, but some people just prefer pill or tablet. That's going to have a more delayed onset. You'll lose some of that, um, you know, CBD to first pass metabolism, but it does have a longer duration. Some people like it for sleep if they have trouble staying asleep, not necessarily falling asleep. Um, so I do prefer the oil to the tablet. Um, topical, I think, is either uh, someone who just doesn't want to take anything under the tongue or orally. Um, or as an adjunct. Um, people certainly do vape these products, but I don't feel um, that I can safely say, you know, vaping really anything is, is safe. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And at this point, that's all. That oh, I'm and for to... food, oh, it, sorry. Mm -hmm. it does, um, Many of CBD products are in some sort of carrier oil that should be high in fatty acids. Um, with, you know, fatty foods, any sort of fatty acid, we do see a better bioavailability. There have been a couple of studies on that. Um, so I wouldn't put it in your food because then you don't get the benefits of using it under your tongue that I just mentioned, but taking it with food um, or even just a little bit of oil or something like an avocado is going to get um, a better, better uptake. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you for those additional details. That's really very helpful. Um, so at this point, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, on behalf of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us and sharing your expertise. Dr. Scapano and Worcester, you were wonderful, and we really, truly, we really appreciate your invaluable guidance uh, that you provided today throughout the presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you'll receive an evaluation link via email today. Please remember to complete it no later than January 27th. If you request a certificate of participation through the evaluation process, that will come to you by February 17th. And again, we will be sending you an email um, probably over the next few days or into early next week with the web webinar recording and slides. So you'll be able to revisit this information and share it with your colleagues. So again, thank you everybody for your participation today. We are so grateful to you and your colleagues for providing care to so many people during this extremely challenging time in healthcare. Please take good care and enjoy the rest of your day.